College as we are celebrating our Golden Jubilee year. The outstanding contribution of the Gobind Singh College for Women, both in academics and sports, is well acknowledged in the city, even as the college attracts students from across India, giving it a multicultural environment. Besides pivoting the spread of spiritually buoyant ideals of Shri Guru Gobind Singh, after whom the college takes its name. The college functions under the very able management of an enlightened and supportive Sikh educational society who work tirelessly towards achieving their objective of imparting comprehensive modern education blended with an ethical dimension. This, week, this year, being our golden jubilee year, has been filled with celebrations and exciting events. This international seminar will no doubt be the frosting on the cake with the illustrious personalities who are gracing the portals of our college today. Good. Yes, I invite Madam Principal Dr. Jitinder Kaur to please accord a formal welcome to our esteemed dignitaries. Very good morning to all. On behalf of the management, staff, and students of Gurbhavan College for Women, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you today at this two-day international seminar sponsored by ICSSR. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome the chief guest of the day, Dr. Sanjay Koshi. Dean College Development Council, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Such as to his credit, more than 30 years of excellence in academics and administrative spheres. Sir, very graciously accepted our invitation to this seminar as he is deeply committed to the cause of quality education. Sir, we welcome you at our institution. We are fortunate to have amongst us here today Dr. Dravinder Kumar Madan, Head, Social of, Head School of Social Sciences, Punjabi University, Patiala, as our guest of honor. Sir, we are grateful to you for your presentation and we welcome you. I also take this opportunity to welcome Professor Pritam Singh, Emeritus Professor of Economics. Oxford Brooks Business School, UK, who very graciously accepted our invitation to deliver the keynote address. Sir, <laughs> there is no introduction. He is a world-renowned economist and authority in his subject. We are grateful, sir, for taking out your time <coughs> from busy schedule to share your valuable insights on this very pertinent topic. The college formally welcomes Professor G. Singh Guzman, Professor of Eminence, Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar, and former Professor of Economics, Krish Chandigarh. Sir will deliver a special lecture and set the intellectual tone for the seminar. I also welcome our panelists, Dr. Sweeta Malhotra, Dr. Asta Dr. Kapila, Dr. Rakesh Sharda, and Dr. Subhash Chandar. I welcome Dr. Sambu Chetri, <coughs> former head food governor, joint secretary PMO Bhutan, who very kindly consented to be the moderator of panel discussion today and to deliver a special lecture tomorrow. I extend a very warm welcome to Sardar Sudev Singh, President, Sikh Education Society, and Colonel Retired Jasmeh Singh Wala, Secretary, Sikh Education Society who are the guiding lights and have always been the source of inspiration in all our endeavors. I also extend a very warm welcome to delegates, researchers, paper presenters and the students from different educational institutions. We hope that today will be a very fruitful day for all of us and that our purpose in organizing this international seminar will serve the mission it has been designed for. With these words, I once again welcome all of you and hope 
and we all will benefit from the insights of our esteemed and sourced persons. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I now request Dr. Rina Pardi, Head, Department of Economics, and the leader of the seminar to present the concept note. Dr. Rina Pardi. Thank you, Dr. Ramni. A very good morning to all of you. Desire was the first seed of mankind, goes a saying in Rig Veda. The desire for a healthy family, a healthy society, and a healthy country that drives individuals and countries alike on the path of progress. Development has been a key driver of global economic relations. Development paradigms have continuously evolved, adapted, and reinvented from economic growth to development to sustainable development. The idea of development as a change for the better has resonated with all civilizations and across time. Development, environment, and sustainability are all normative concepts with implications for ethics and justice. However, 2020 brought to forefront the economic effects of the global pandemic wrought by the spread of COVID-19 that threatens to undo many of the perceived global gains realized in the development context. The concepts of swas, sampan, and resilience all being interdependent have all the more become the global keywords. The seminar aims to dwell upon these concepts and also to establish the integrated relationship between health and wellness and the capacity building to fight back and grow. Swastha Bharat se Sampan Bharat, resilience, the need of the art. The Constitution of India had provision for an all encompassing right to life that implies the right to live with dignity, a right to minimum subsistence and included all those aspects of life that go to make a man's life meaningful, complete and worth living. Our life in Article 21 is not merely a physical act of breathing, it implies the right to food, safe drinking water, pollution-free environment, education, medical care and shelter. Akna Desh called for an assurance of a dignified life to the people of a country to develop basic human capabilities, the threshold level of capabilities beneath which truly human functioning was not possible. Traversing the path of development, addressing the question of poverty, inequality, unemployment, availability of food, nutrition, housing, their impact on various health indicators as of mortality, morbidity, maternal and child health, an emerging concern has been the threat of non-communicable diseases posed by rapid urbanization, globalization of unhealthy lifestyles. These are posing a major threat to development, economic growth and human health worldwide. India has played an essential role in including mental health in the definition of NCDs and in addressing mental health conditions at national and international levels. The World Economic Forum report on economics of non-communicable diseases in India has brought out that NCDs and mental health conditions could cost the world $47 trillion in lost economic output from 2010 to 30 if urgent action is not taken to prevent and treat them. Physical health is correlated with mental health and healthy living is about behavior change and thus one of the most challenging aspects. So we need to grid up our loins to make new India swastha bharat in the coming years. Generating an awareness about its need and ways would be a significant element of the seminar. India is on the cusp of major transformation with a young population and emerging innovation and business ecosystems. Being the sixth largest economy in the world, India is poised to become a 5 trillion economy by 2526 and is aspiring to be a 10 trillion economy by 2030, pursuing an inclusive and sustainable growth trajectory by stimulating manufacturing, building infrastructure, spurring investments, fostering technological innovations, boosting entrepreneurship and an increasing demand for scientific inputs. 
Digital revolution has opened the nation to a golden pipeline of new opportunities around mission-driven research, innovation, and technological development. With better technology, liberalized policies, and accelerated domestic manufacturing and exports, India's growth technology has the capacity to transform the life of every citizen. That transition from Swastha Bharat to Sampan Bharat cannot be achieved solely by conventional methods. It requires a paradigm shift in the thought process, methods, and tools of the policy makers, institutions, and people in general. A collective action is essential for the making the game-changing steps. The identified focus areas that require a paradigm shift are agriculture, industry, communication, integration of digital technologies and innovation, infrastructure, logistics and transport, education and employment, health and wellness, local governance, environmental challenges, etc. Recently released book, South Asia's Path to Resilient Growth by IMF on January 6, 2023, has dealt upon the fact that resilience building has several dimensions and is essential in making policies effective, institutions stronger, and is of utmost importance in the context of climate changes. All call for a sharper focus on implementing the flagship schemes already in place or a new design and initiative to achieve India's true potential thereby making it a land of immense opportunities. In this context, the two-day seminar seeks to critically reflect on a variety of issues revolving around the broader theme of Swastha Bharat, say Sampan Bharat, having a bearing on the emerging challenges and opportunities. It would also provide an occasion to bring a diversity of views and themes related to this for critical deliberation in order to raise awareness among the society to support healthy, equitable, and sustainable economies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reena. Thank you, Dr. Reena. And now with this, we come to the most awaited keynote address to be delivered by the illustrious Professor Pritam Singh. Professor Pritam Singh, who was still recently a visiting scholar at Brookson College, Oxford, took his DPhil from Oriel College University of Oxford, where he was awarded the prestigious Edward Boyle Charles Wallace Scholarship. He is now Professor Emeritus at Oxford Brooks Business School and has published several books with great reviews, besides having edited many. He has uh, published many. Uh, he has been published in many refuge journals, including the World Development, the most reputed journal in development studies. He is also on the editorial board of several journals. His papers have been translated in many languages: French, Spanish, Russian, Polish, <coughs> Korean, and many Indian languages, including Punjabi. He is the proud recipient of several international awards. He was awarded the Distinguished Achievement Award in Political Economy for the 21st century by the World Association of Political Economy and the Lifetime Achievement Award for his distinguished contribution to the Punjab Research Group in the UK to promote Sikh and Punjab studies in 2021 by the University of California. Sir, we are truly beholden to you for agreeing to deliver the keynote address, Professor Preetal Singh. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me properly? Yes. yes sir. Uh, where is the presentation? Why did you come here? Um, I'm, I'm very uh, honored and humbled to come to this college uh, in the name of the Gopin Singh. There are very few examples in world history you can compare the state of It is our failure that we have to reach the world as we should about the indescribable courage, bravery, saintliness, scholarship of Guru Gobind Singh. So it is an honor to come to a college which is named after him. I must also say that college uh, I must thank uh, in particular 
Dr. Kamaji for Narvaha, who is responsible for bringing me here. Because I did not know anyone else in the college. college. She attended some seminar of mine and got to know me. She contacted me if I would come. And I quickly agreed without knowing the implications of what she was asking for. And, and when you did that, you were know, here. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. And, and thank to you for keeping in touch and, and uh, arranging uh, uh, everything. Uh, I'm also very happy to meet uh, uh, Dr. Gurdjieff Singh Barad, whose name I've heard before, and Kitri Saad, whose work I know about uh, Bhutan. I'm fascinated by the example of uh, uh, Bhutan. And my dear friend, Professor Kumar, uh, we are fellow from this, and we work together in many areas and share many ideas. So, uh, <clears throat> let's start with uh, uh, what I want to speak on. Um, I thought about in consultation with the uh, party that I'll speak on the environment. And I thought I'd speak on the global environmental challenge. Now, it's a huge topic. And it's difficult to sum it up, uh, what I want to say in 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, and of course, we have kept the time for 10, 15 minutes for the discussion afterwards. But I must also say that my, my email address will be mentioned uh, when my name comes. So if you feel like that you haven't understood anything or you want to explore, feel free to email me. I may not reply on the same day, but I will reply. And, and, and feel free to send me your comments, criticisms, inquiries, <coughs> because this is also a learning process to, to, to come to college and not only share your own thoughts, it's also you want the feedback. And, and that's it's a kind of cooperative effort in, in learning. So let's start with the first slide. Um, who is who is monitoring the? She's, she's there. Yeah. So go to the first slide, which which puts the title and my name, which also has the before it's before the that before that. No. Start from the very beginning. I was worried about this. Uh, whether it is now something is wrong. <coughs> Go to the first slide, slide number one. Yeah, that's the one. Yes, so that is the topic. I'm, I'm going to speak about the uh, Global Environment Challenge. Its implications for health and resilience will emerge, though I'm not going to be very explicit about it, but there are implicit uh, implications. Uh, about health and resilience uh, from this. So, um, my email address is mentioned there, very simple, psing.ac.uk. And feel free to, uh, if not, uh, send me your comments, etc. So, um, uh, next, next slide. So, that's the overview which I'm going to cover. The relationship between economy and nature, which is a relatively new discipline itself. Uh, the economists in the past do not know much about nature. And it's true of me as well. Uh, it's after going to Oxford, actually I developed a course on environmental economics. There, there, is a, there is a system in the university that after every five years, the entire course is rethought about it. And the department thought that yes, we should have a course on environmental economics. And I was given the responsibility of that. And that has been the most popular course. And, and Sometimes I hear examples of students coming and telling me that after listening to that course, their life, life course has been changed. That they're not going to do anything else except they're dealing with environmental issues. So I'll, I'll speak a bit about that. It's a vast topic, but I'll, I'll cover some parts of this. Then I'll speak about the global environmental crisis. What do we mean when we say there is an environmental crisis? What exactly do we mean by that? I'll try to summarize in, in briefly. Then the manifestations of this crisis, and how do we see that this crisis is manifesting itself? And then what are the paths towards economic development? I must say that this word economic development has been used in a hesitant way. Uh, as you will see, I will be critical of the concept of development itself as it is used in the uh, economics discipline these days. And a lot of new thinking is developing on that. So let's go to the first one, the relationship between economy and nature. Next slide. Now, very simply, some of you, those who are uh, 
in the subject of economics probably would know that the first important function or the first important relationship between economics and nature is that nature provides the sources. Environment provides all the sources. All the sources which we need for production, for distribution, for consumption, they are provided by nature. Land, water, forest, air, all provided by nature. So in a way, one can say nature is the starting point for, for providing economic activities. Uh, it is taken for granted, but we will, when we will explore a little bit more, we will know that actually it is much more complicated than simply saying that nature provides uh, resources. The second important function is that the environment also absorbs waste. Because whenever we produce something, or whenever we consume something, there is an immediate outcome of that is waste. That every everything which has been produced eventually becomes waste. Okay, we are sitting in this big hall. There are so many things. There is my watch. There is my specs box. There is this uh, equipment. There is this building. Each one of them have a limited life. Uh, this watch may have a life of ten years. This might have a life of two years. This building might have a life of five hundred years. Everything which is produced becomes waste. And from the viewpoint of Understanding the environmental consequences of activities or our daily activities, day to day activities. Since that time, we get up in the morning, till we go to sleep, individually or with our economies function, we need to recognize that all economic activities eventually end in waste. And what happens to that waste? Environment based part of that waste. How, do we, how does the environment absorb that waste? It absorbs the waste in land. Lots of things are put into land. Lots of things are thrown into water. Okay, lots of emissions go into the air. And the environment has enormous capacity to absorb that waste. But the environment does not have unlimited capacity to absorb that waste. We will come to that in a minute. So it absorbs the waste, and therefore, if it were not to absorb the waste, our life will become unlivable. Okay? If all that waste was kept on mountain, then we will suffocate with that waste. Mm -hmm. So environment not only provides a source, it also takes account of the waste which we generate from the use of those uh, sources. Third, the environment provides very valuable services. Uh, we will elaborate on that a little bit. So let's go into the first one, the sources. What are the sources? Environment provides three kinds of resources. Non-renewable resources, renewable resources, and continuous resources. Many of you probably would have, especially those who are uh, from economics, might be familiar with these terms. Uh, but the distinction between the renewable and continuous is the one where I'm going to elaborate a little bit more. Non-renewable resources are those resources whose total supply is limited in a large span. Okay. Which means that the total stock of those resources is limited, whatever may be the amount, but it's limited, it can't be standard. Most fossil fuels, and most important are oil and coal, which produce energy, but also various minerals like copper, cobalt, aluminium. Their total supply in the entire uh, natural universe is limited, which does not mean that there may be some hidden sources somewhere, but they may be so difficult to access. They may be oil, you know, oil and, and coal lying in the mountains of Afghanistan, but the amount of resources which will be required to access that will be enormous. That means that it is actually not possible to access uh, those resources. Secondly, all the important resources of these renewable resources have been already exploited. And if we have to search for new, they are of no oil. So even if oil is being uh, searched somewhere, it's of no quality. So which means, that these are sources that come to an end one day. Okay? All the oil in the world that we have will come to an end. It may be 50 years, it may be 100 years, but it will come to an end. So that, that <coughs> is meant by non renewable resources. So if our economy, if our daily life is dependent on that, if our life is dependent on production of energy from oil and coal, we are heading for a big crisis. And that's one reason the world is not turning. There are other reasons, of course, more important reasons. But this is one reason 
that we are turning towards the renewable sources. Mm -hmm. And this is very interesting that some of the firms and corporations which earn huge profits from these non-renewable sources, for example oil, okay, they are also now moving into renewable sources. And they are also doing a lot of public relations. You might have heard the name of BP, which is called British Petroleum. And they have designed themselves as BP, but they call it beyond petroleum. So they, they, it is still BP, but it's beyond petroleum. They're knowing that petroleum will come to an end, they are into this uh, renewable resource. But in long time, these companies actually thwart researches in, in, in the renewable resource. They, they put pressures on the government not to do research on solar energy, not to put energy, not to put into wind energy and you know other forms of uh, renewable resources. So non-renewable resources will come to an end one day. Therefore, our land has come to renewable resources. Renewable sources are those resources which are capable of being reproduced, provided they are managed in a sensible way. Now, that's an important qualification. And one very easy example which we come to people's mind is forest or water to some extent. Though so water is not exactly a renewable resource, it can become non-renewable or fish, you know. Uh, forest for this reason that if you are sensible, you can cut one part of the forest and let the main part of the forest standing and by the time you want to cut the one which has been left uncut, by that time the one which was already cut has grown up. So you can have a cycle of continuously uh, growing. Similarly one can say about water. If water can be recycled and reused, it can remain, but there is a risk. There is a risk that water can also get exhausted. And there are examples, and this is particularly important for Punjab. Okay, and, and those of you, and I'm sure majority of you are from Punjab, I know about Punjab. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> that water is uh, potentially, potentially renewable, not, not, not automatically renewable, potentially renewable, which means that there is also a possibility that it might get exhausted. There are examples of uh, countries, uh, regions and countries, which were water rich and have now become barren. There is a small region in Kenya which used to export uh, flowers to the Western countries. Okay? And uh, every day, and flower growing is very, very intense growth. And in, 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 in the small period of time, they made good amount of profits, the corporation was running them, but that region has become less you now because water has been exhausted. And that is one big challenge which is Punjab is facing. Many of you would have seen a lot of material written on this. I have also written and published in, in some. I try to write in the public, you know, uh, public media. Some of you might have seen my articles in the new. And, and so that the search does not remain only in the university, it is widely distributed. That we had the revolution, which was based on getting water intensive use especially on Pedi and now there are many blocks in, 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 in Punjab which, which are really uh, you know reaching the level of desertification. So water is also not uh, a permanent renewable source. Uh, so uh, the point is that renewable sources can be used in a rational and, and a manageable way that they can be continued and we need to be aware. Continuous sources are different from both non-renewable and renewable sources in this fashion, very important distinction. Both non-renewable and renewable sources are dependent upon human use of those resources. Okay? Continuous those resources are which do not deplete, do not get depleted by human use. Now I'm sure many of you will be immediately able to guess what are the continuous resources, solar energy. Sun does not stop providing us its sunshine because we are enjoying the sunshine. Okay? And, and uh, so solar energy is really the energy of the future. Okay? If we have to survive uh, uh, at, at the planet. Of course, wind energy, surf energy, even energy from the earth. There are uh, some experiments in Denmark which are being conducted where energy is actually being produced from the earth, neither from the sun, uh, not from the wind. Uh, 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 not from uh, any other sources, not from the sea, uh, but from the earth. There is, there, is, there is warmth in the earth which can be tapped. 
and and uh, so continuing the sources are those of sources whose supply is unlimited. In comparison to the non-renewable, which is limited, continuous sources are those which is unlimited, provided we are able to use them. And that's what I'm saying is in the future. And and some of you might want to do the search when you grow up. That is the idea to do research. And there are immense uh, uh, opportunities in that. So let's go to the next one. Okay, so as I said, the first function is to provide the sources and second is to absorb the uh, waste. This absorption of waste is very important because if this waste is not absorbed, or let's put it another way, that when we use these sources, as I said, we create waste and that waste is absorbed. But the environment does not have unlimited capacity to absorb these waste. Putting in a slightly technical fashion, we can say, if the rate of absorption of waste is more than the rate of duration of waste, then that waste is pollution. Okay? Because what we put in the uh, uh, land or what we throw in the water, nature has enormous capacity to decompose that material and then recreate its resource. Okay? But nature does not have the dominant capacity because it takes certain time to decompose that material. If in the meanwhile we keep on putting more waste, nature cannot re recreate. So that's what we, when we say that land is polluted, it's not because we have thrown, thrown waste into it. Or when we say water is polluted, it's not that we have thrown material. The human beings have been throwing things into the water, but water has been... I spent my early childhood in a village in Punjab, and, and I remember the water used to be clean even in the rivers. People could actually drink water from the rivers. And, and now entire water is polluted. You know, people have to use artificial means. To, to, to purify that water. It is because the amount of waste which is being thrown into water is higher than water can absorb that uh, waste. And it obviously has some you know, uh, uh, implications in terms of health, the, the quality of that water, not only for human consumption, but also consumption of animals, but also use in land. The, 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 the crops which are grown with that water, which is polluted water, are also uh, polluted. So that has and, and here I must also mention a little bit about uh, tourism. Because many times people say that Punjab can be made more touristic or Golden Temple can be used to attract more tourism. So tourism has very negative aspect of this. Because whichever area becomes very touristy is also just environmentally degraded. Because the amount of waste which tourists create, you know, leads to litter and uh, I mean, Amatsar is one example, and, and I have gone several times to Amatsar. It pains me to see that Amatsar is such a dirty spot. You know, Golden Temple area is very dirty. You know, it's one of the most beautiful parts of the world. But outside Amatsar is so dirty. And I see part of the reason could be uh, tourism. It could be also the lack of consciousness on the part of the of uh, Amatsar for the municipal corporation. I haven't investigated in depth, but that's my kind of uh, 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 guess. Okay, so let's go to the next one, uh, the third function, which is the uh, provision of uh, environmental services. Now, this is that environment regulates the climate. That, you know, we have the seasons of winter, summer, spring, and fall. We, we, we change from one to another. Nature has an automatically built cycle into it. That we can't keep on remaining in hot weather, nor do we keep on remaining in very cold weather. If we were to remain in a cold weather, we would freeze to death. And if we remain totally under, under summer, we will be actually burned to death. And nature has an environment. That cycle gets disrupted when environment is destroyed. Okay? And uh, I wrote an article in the Tribune this year because I thought many people would know. For the first time in Britain, temperature went beyond 40 in the entire history of that country. In June, in uh, three places, temperature was 40.1, 40.2, 40.3. They had never heard of an example. We are, of course, people in this part and the third world, they we all know about 45, 49 even. They, they think that 35, 36 is the maximum. You know, and, and they start jumping into lakes and rivers the temperature. But for the first time, they had experienced this. So, so, so the, the, that affects the quality of uh, 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 air which we breathe, that, that has implications for health, people being not dehydration. There were people who were walking on the street and they were, they were collapsing because they were not used to this uh, degree of uh, uh, heat. So, 
environment provide that uh, services. Of course, environment is a source of entire amount of creativity. Environment is a source of a lot of poetry. Okay, all the romantic poetry is about the loveliness of the moon, about the you know wind, the beautiful wind, and, and of course it changes from weather to weather. Here we think about the clouds and the rain as, as beautiful weather, and, and that is a source of romantic poetry. In England, it's the sunshine because sunshine is so scarce. But nonetheless, that is the source of enormous creative, artistic creativity, our paintings, and, and which enrich our lives. And, and, and so environment provides that beauty also. So environment is a source of beauty as well. And, and um, uh, a few months back, I delivered a lecture on Pai Lee Singh, who is 150th birthday birthday. And, and when I had to prepare my lecture on that, I, I observed that he was so fascinated with nature. He used to go to Kashmir, which of course is now so difficult to go to. And, and, uh, um, and he was fascinated with the beauty of Kashmir. There's one whole book on that. So it is, and he produced some of the most beautiful uh, poetry by, by being in that, uh, that process. So that's the third function of the uh, environment, provide resources. And this can get completed with the first two use. So let's go to the next one. So what is a global environment crisis? Global environment crisis is a crisis of all the people which I mentioned. It is a function of the sources not being available. As I said, non-renewable sources are going to be depleted. Renewable sources are also potentially can be depleted. So, uh, so one is the depletion of resources. That is also a crisis. Second is a enormous amount of waste which is created. Because, it, I mean, I'll take a minute to explain this. That a source use and waste is the same thing. Because waste comes from sources. So the moment we use a source, we are also taking a uh, And third, of course, it impairs the, the, the provision of services, which I said, you know, that uh, the, 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 you know, the ugliness of the environment which, which is created by the use of sources. If, if deforestation takes place, if uh, uh, two young intellectuals who picked me up yesterday from the railway station, they were telling me that Chandigarh has become so uh, difficult to uh, uh, you know, uh, transport because there's so much of pollution. And I was saying that this is because the way cities have been designed. Cities have been designed in such a way that they have been designed to have car use. And car is a monster, you know, and, and car is an environmental monster. It looks very beautiful and responsible. Of course, air data is also monster. I'm guilty of traveling uh, by air. And, and, you know, these are some of the compromises we make in life. But, uh, so, so, this, this, the beauty has been impaired by the successive use of those uh, uh, resources. So global environmental crisis is a crisis of a depletion of resources, creating waste, and impairing the quality of services which environment can provide. And that leads to the manifestation of the crisis. Next. So manifestation of the crisis, global environmental crisis. The first important manifestation is global heating or global warming. And normally people use the word global warming, but increasingly more critical minded environmentalists have started using the word global heating. Because warming suggests slow kind of process. Heating is much more sharp. And what we are witnessing now is global heating. Okay? That the scale at which the highest temperatures are going and the, the hottest number of years are the last 10 years. And, and it's leading to global heating. I'll see a little bit more on, 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 on that. The second is biodiversity loss. Biodiversity loss is just enormous. Uh, I just saw a report yesterday which looked at the uh, this international report on the loss of birds, animals, uh, reptiles, uh, amphibians, especially the, the sea creatures. The degree of loss which is taking place is just enormous, which means that it is true that in the evolution of humanity, in the evolution of nature, it is true that some species do decline and sometimes do species develop. And, but the scale at which the uh, biodiversity loss is not taking place is just enormous. You mentioned uh, earlier about uh, the, the new viruses which are coming. Part of the reason is coming from that. 
that that human beings are encroaching the space of all other uh, non-human uh, living beings, and that and those non-human beings are you know then coming into contact with human beings and becoming the source of the problem. Biodiversity loss is, in, is important not only because of sentimental reasons, something that okay some bees if they go extinct, why should we bother? Because this is a rate of the food chain. One kind of species is a spot, is a food for the other kind of species, and that is a further source of uh, human uh, use. So there is a whole linkage which is involved uh, with that. And biodiversity loss is also keeping the quality of the land. Because if some kind of germs get uh, eliminated, that affect the quality of the land, the quality of soil which is going to produce food for us. So this is just enormous that what used to happen in thousands of years, now is happening in decades, the number of biodiversity losses is taking place. So it's not simply kind of romantic uh, uh, obsession that sounds, you know, rare species are going to go, lions are going to go, or, you know, it is actually a, a question of human existence. Uh, then this uh, uh, pre-capitalist and capitalist era. The capitalist era, one can say, it is, I mean, the historians differ on this. Some would say that it's about 200 years since the industrial revolution in the 19th century. Some would stretch it to 15th century. But one can certainly say that there is a clear distinction between the pre-capitalist era and the capitalist era. In the pre-capitalist era, the use of resources are not that enormous. More or less production was more localized. That the youth people produced food and they ate the same kind of food. There was not enormous amount of trade, and therefore there was no circulation of even disease and you know what, what happened with the circulation of goods and uh, commodities. And therefore the quality of nature was much, much, much sound and much more beautiful and much more fruitful. With the development of capitalist era, environment destruction has been enormous. Uh, uh, proportion. Because what does capital do? Capital looks at every source of the root of profitability. Whether it's land, whether it's water, whether it's air, whether it's forest. For capital, the aim is to accept profit from that. Okay? Otherwise, capital has no other relationship with, with, with those levels. For capital, nature is a source of profitability. And that is what is leading to environmental destruction. And from that, Two new views have developed. One is called Anthropocene, another is called Capitalocene. Anthropocene and Capitalocene is a controversy which is taking place. That the kind of global warming which we are seeing, the biodiversity loss, is it because human beings are themselves destructive? Anthropocene refers to that. That human beings are most intelligent living creatures. Okay? Uh, of course, other creatures are also very intelligent, but they don't have a language or they don't have a written language. We are more intelligent than other living creatures because we have a written language through which we can transmit knowledge from one to the other. The, the, the animals and the birds are also intelligent creatures. They also have sentiments, they also have emotions, they, they, they also sing poetry, they also sing songs. They communicate all that, but they don't have a written language which they can use. So some, some, some environmentalists believe that it is this inherent uh, uh, strength of human beings over other non-human beings, which has actually led to human beings conquering all other non-living beings. And this nature is not meant only for human beings. This nature is meant for all living creatures. You know, it is meant for animals, it's meant for birds, it's meant for trees, it's meant for all other living creatures. And what the human beings have done, they are, they are, they are capturing the space of all other non-human uh, living beings. That is the Anthropocene. Capitalocene people, it's a controversy, it's a quite bitter controversy, those who actually uh, decide. I'm somewhere in the middle. And, and uh, I'll, I'll explain why I'm in the middle. That uh, Capitalocene people argue that this is mainly because of the rise of capitalism. That since capitalist mode of production and is coming to human history, that has become environmentally destructive. So it's not that human beings themselves are greedy and human beings are themselves you know, destructive to other non-human living beings. It is because how capital uses them in order to do that, that they have become destructive. I think what has happened is that the, the capacity of human beings to dominate non-human beings predates capitalism, but it has been accelerated the capitalism.
So that's why I'm, I'm in the middle uh, of this debate that I think that it's not a capitalism created human beings dominating other non-human beings. It, 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 it existed in the pre-capitalist era also, but it has been accelerated enormously uh, since the advent of uh, and, and one of the implications of that is pollution. And, and uh, uh, I think we, we can go to the next uh, uh, session. <coughs> I'm, I'm not very sure whether I'm keeping the time. Uh, okay, so one of the implications of this is global heat. Okay, which, which is which is people can capture, which ordinary people can also capture. And I'll just mention uh, uh, one figure: 1.5 would be global temperature increased by 2030 compared to global temperature during the peak of the age. That is roughly due. this 1.5 degree centigrade increase has been captured unanimously by the UN International Panel on Climate Change. And, and it's important to understand how that panel works. That panel is, is a, on the whole conservative panel. That because they have to arrive at a consensus. Within, within that there are differences. There are some scientists who think that even 1.5 degrees is too much. That actually we should reduce to that. But they come to a conclusion. Which means that if Global temperature rises above 1.5 degrees centigrade compared to the average global temperature, which existed in 1850. We are heading for irreversible damage. That the, the scale of damage will be such we will not be able to control. Okay. Therefore, we can say we are in 23 already. So only seven years are there, and that is what is meant by global emergency, environmental emergency. Some people use it apocalypse that we are heading for apocalypse. The, the scale is, is so enormous. We need to be urgent about it. And the political leadership all over the world is not up to the task. The prime ministers, the ministers, we might say that they, they hold important positions. Many of them are ignorant. Some of them who are not ignorant, they are, they are the very controlled to global corporations. For example, President Obama and Tony Blair, they are very intelligent creatures. They understood this, but they didn't do anything. Because they are so close to all corporations who did not want this uh, uh, you know, fact to be brought into. So there is a conflict between science and narrow economic interests. And, 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 and this is being banned through this. I hope that the scientific knowledge culminates, disseminates into larger number of people acquiring consciousness. I would think that if after my lecture, some of you absorb this, that 1.5 degree global temperature increase by 2030 is heading for a apocalypse. We will start thinking about our daily lives and also about the lives of institutions and, and countries. And I would think that, that will be a good outcome of the lecture. Okay, let's go ahead. Um, biodiversity loss, I've already mentioned that either there's a decline of the uh, various species uh, or there's a disappearance of uh, the violet, you know, uh, biological diversity. And uh, some of that is also leading to genetic variability, which is, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, natural outcome, but it is also the outcome of the way these resources are uh, being uh, used. And ecosystems are being disturbed, that the rivers are not having the same kind of quality of water. The pet land is being reduced, the quality of the land gets reduced as a result of the biodiversity. Of I think we'll go to the next. Yeah, I have partly covered in this that the, the capitalism endeavors, uh, there, is, there, is, there is a kind of conflict between capitalism and nature. That capitalism <coughs> is inherently nature destroying, which does not mean that there are individual firms which does not want environmental destruction. And one of the things in the business is that insurance firms are very much interested in preventing climate damage. Because insurance firms know that if more climate emergencies start taking place, more people will make claims and that will pressure on them. So they are in the vanguard of saying that we should protect the environment because they don't want to pay uh, premium, you know, compensation to people who get damaged by this. So I've mentioned about feudalism and mercantilism, that feudalism is a pre-capitalist era, that it is a generally production was for immediate consumption. So that's a big difference between feudalism and, and capitalism. Feudalism was an era where production was mainly oriented to local production, local consumption. And capitalism is an era that becomes more and more global. Mercantilism comes somewhere in between. 
that it started within the boom of uh, feudalism, then grew into uh, uh, capitalism. And uh, now the, the last point is very interesting that the lack of capitalism, lack of capitalism slows down production and, and lessens pace. That if we slow down economic growth, and this is something very touchy for economists, traditional economists, I would say, because they are so obsessed with economic growth. They are almost addicted with economic growth, I would say. They think that economic growth is the thing, right? We have to grow and grow and grow and grow. Everything comes out of growth. But it is showing that if economic growth is slowed in some areas, actually it is good for the environment. It is good for decreasing the cost. And, and some, some countries in Latin America, uh, some countries in Latin America are doing this better. For example, they are saying, keep the oil in the soil, keep the coal in the hole, that don't bring the <coughs> coal outside, because the moment you bring the coal outside, it will be burnt, the moment it's burnt, it will take carbon dioxide. Similarly, we don't want the oil to be explored, so they have to be opposed to oil exploration, they are opposed to coal, coal exploration, and they are willing to just have a lower level of uh, the economic growth. Let's go to the next. <coughs> I, I think I've already covered this and so forth in that, that two, two, two uh, basic, basic uh, 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 differences. One, where the human beings as a species themselves are destructive of others or this destructive that has been created by capitalism. And I said I'm in between. I think that human beings are, to some extent it's true that human beings are, if not destructive, they're dominant to other human beings. They, they slave other, 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 other creatures. They love other creatures also. We love dogs and cats, you know. And, 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 uh, but they also enslave uh, other, other uh, living species. And uh, so this has been accelerated by uh, that. Okay, let's go ahead. And that leads to pollution. And um, pollution of land, pollution of air, and pollution of uh, water. And pollution of land obviously leads to pollution of food. So that's the first problem. That the, that the food which gets produced, Punjab is a prime example of that. Punjab's land is polluted. And the food which is coming from the Punjab land is also polluted. Okay. The, the wheat, the rice, whatever, you know, it is so much dependent on fertilizer, insecticides, pesticides. Some of the big well-off farmers, I have a nephew who had built a very big house, so he wanted to show me off. So he took me to show me off. And then I saw my very big vessel. I said, what is this? He says, Mamanji, this is our desi country. You know? So they, they, they know that the, the one which they are selling in the market is destructive. But for them, they are producing this desi uh, country, which is not fertilized for their own consumption. So, so uh, land is polluted, land production has implications. Food production, then if we, uh, if we, if we, if we, if we, if we consume uh, polluted uh, food products, we are also likely to feel ill. Someone told me an example of, of uh, a, 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 in, in Delhi, that a person was used to take uh, juice produced from um, Krela, the Krela juice, which was supposed to be very healthy. And he used to take uh, every day because it was just that very helpful. He had certain illnesses. And the person died. Of it. And then they found that he did not die because anything, any ill effect of the Krela. Because the Krela, which has been actually produced with so much fertilizer and insecticide, mm -hmm. that is what led to it. You know? so, so the food which we are eating from that polluted land is also damaging for health. Air, of course, is very well known. There are, there are experiments conducted on children where parents live close by to the motorways and parents who live far away from the motorways. So the air pollution which uh, families which live near the uh, motorways are actually consuming more. Those children have damaged uh, 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 body, <coughs> damaged brain also. That, and this damage starts even below the age of two. So actually, and sometimes even while, while the children are in the in the womb of the mother, they are being damaged with that process. So the air pollution is, has huge amount of uh, implications for uh, some of the things which you mentioned in your, and of course water, you know, that uh, 
uh, there are very interesting statistics available that the number of children who die in the world, not because of uh, bad food, because of they don't have sufficient clothes, or they don't live in good houses, because they are using contaminated water. Waterborne disease in childhood kill millions of children every year. And I always tell my students that that's one topic for the research. If you can do, if you devote your life to a good cause, how to, how to have clean water. That's the basic principle. You know, it's, a, it's a public one. So with prioritization, this has been kind of uh, a damage. Next. Okay, so then comes the question, what do we do? Where do we go from there? Okay. And, and uh, the, you know, and again I'm saying that I'm using the word economic development, you know, with, with, with a question mark in my mind that whether it's the right thing to do because as I said, economists are used to growth, but they might replace it with development. The difference is not much. Both mean, both mean increase in GDP. And uh, whether we should go for maximum economic growth, or there are some people who should say that we zero growth. We should not have any more growth. There's already enough production in the world. What we need to do is more do equitably. It should be distributed more equitably. There's a lot of growth in that. Some people say that not only zero growth, we need to have degrowth. We, whatever we are doing, we need to grow even less than that because we have damaged so much. There is a professor, Jim Pandel, in, in, in uh, England, who has written a paper called Deep Adaptation. And uh, it's actually available on the, on the Google. And if you, if you just Google Deep Adaptation, you'll be able to see that paper. It's available as, as PDF. He has come out, uh, he's done very brilliant research, and that corresponds with him. And he's saying that. The degree of damage to the environment so much, whatever adaptation we might, because there are two things which are said in environmental mitigation adaptation. Mitigation is that we should start changing our practices of production so that less carbon dioxide is produced. Adaptation is that whatever environmental damage takes place, we should try to adapt to that. He is saying that forget about mitigation. Already so much carbon dioxide emissions have been produced, you cannot. You cannot stop that, but uh, damage, damage is going to take place. And he thinks that damage is going to take place so much that millions of people are going to die. And he's saying that it's, it's some very, very close people to us who will die. So we need to learn to grieve. His whole thesis is that the only thing we can deal, deal is learn to grieve. And he tried to put kind of picture that grieving is not necessarily something sad, grieving is also very spiritual. That when someone close to us, our parents or our sibling die, there is something very, very spiritual which emerges in us, something very pure in us. And he said that he actually gives theory in people that how we should be. I don't believe in his theory because that is like saying that we should be dead. Everything is damaged, nothing can be done, we are all going to die or our, you know, I don't think that is right. We still have the, you know, the time to, to save ourselves. Sustainable growth is uh, one which I, I would say sustainable development rather than growth is what I agree with. Part of the reason is this, that there is a big difference between the developed countries and the developing countries. Degrowth growth is certainly uh, useful in the developed countries, but a lot of developing countries still have need for resources to provide schools, hospitals, roads, basic minimum needs. A lot of people don't have housing, and, and so we need, so there is, there is a need for a distinction between uh, this. And finally, contraction and convergence is the principle that the developed countries need to contract and developing countries need to grow so that they can work and uh, that there should be global equality in that. Okay, I think I'm perfect to more time people are getting this. And, and, and let's go to the next one. And this requires both macro policies and micro initiatives. Macro policies are international level, like the Paris and global climate, national policies, and, and uh, we should be full of production of energy. That some people are saying that we need a new uh, system. Uh, we need a socialist system, but not the old socialist. Because what happened in Russia, or Soviet Union, or China, was also high degree of industrialization of the environment. We need a new kind of socialism, which is ecological socialism, that is based on equality, but is based on compatibility with ecology with the nature. 
And this requires micro uh, initiatives also. Institutions also need to have uh, uh, policies and they need to, they need to have reforms that even if uh, uh, it is being produced with uh, profit, that they can introduce it to the reforms and we should support that. And individuals have a lot of role to play. I've written one further article on the role of individuals in, in, in controlling the environmental damage and it will be in the list of references which I want to come later. I think I've exceeded my time if I'm and, 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 and So let's go to the last, last one, and which is conclusion. So basically, to conclude that environment provides resources and, and uh, three functions, and environmental crisis a crisis for the three functions, and the urgency of controlling the global climate change is 1.5 degrees, which I said is something you take away from this lecture. And, and we need both macro policy and, 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 and paradigms, and uh, uh, which kind of system it is, it is dependent, and micro initiatives. Institutions have to take a role, individuals have to take a role, and what kind of food we have, how, we trans how, how, how much transport we use, how much clothes we wear, do we keep on shopping more and more, or do we need to reduce more, you know, uh, putting resources, uh, uh, use and, and decline and use, recycling, reuse, and so on and so forth. So, last one, and, and I'll end with that, and that will be the reference. <coughs> And uh, this, the college will ask me, I'll, how the college will circulate that. Any of you need to read this paper, I'll be happy to send you. Thank you very much. So that was indeed an eye-opening talk. We are all aware about the dangers of global heating. The use of the word apocalypse has indeed shaken us. And we hope the policymakers have the good sense to do something before it actually happens. But at individual level, we all should make our effort. <laughs> Sir has also given some very valuable suggestions about areas in which, which research could be done. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> our chief guest is uh, a very busy person and has asked me not to read his letter because he's in a hurry to reach for a meeting. So I request him right away to come and say a few words of encouragement to us. Thank you so much. Colonel Balaji, good day, Singh Ji. President Pritam Singh Ji, we heard uh, just now. Our host, D.K. Madanji, Professor Gomanji, the principal of the college, Dr. Jalindir Bhav, Dr. Reena Pathe, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, and the students present here. <coughs> Let me begin with uh, congratulating this college, the principal, and the Department of Economics, and uh, of course everyone who is associated with organizing this seminar. Because very apt title, very apt theme for which we all have gathered, and I know by the time uh, this two-day seminar is over, the purpose for which uh, we all have gathered would be served. When it says, uh, Swast Bharat Sampanna Bharat, Believe me, this is the need of the earth. Where from uh, do we begin? Individual, when he is healthy, and when I say he, I mean both he and she. So when individual is healthy, the family is healthier, the nation is healthier and only then we will be able to work and make this nation which we call as Sampanna Bharat. Over the years uh, what has happened, look 140 crores plus of the people we have uh, in India and what transpired in the couple of years uh, when it was the corona period uh, throughout the world and what is happening even after that, that June 2022, 7-8 months back I am talking. You know the latest figure says that if somebody gets ill, 
for 2,000 people, only one bed is available in India. For 2,000 people. For 13, 50 people, we have only one doctor available in India. And imagine, and why to imagine, we all have gone through this when uh, the corona period was here. Everyone, uh, probably in everyone's family, when uh, we got ill, we were not able to find, and even today, in 2023, February, we are talking, you go to a hospital, to the tune of even PGI Chandigarh, you will not get the most required equipments if you get ill. You know, and the people have to be shifted to the other uh, private hospitals with the, we all know the kind of expenditure we make. And that is why when we say that Swastha Bharat, how important this is to be healthier. You know, when we were uh, very young in the schools, we were told and uh, made to study, which said that uh, a healthy body resides in the healthy mind. Probably that time we could not understand uh, what does this mean. And over the years, uh, you know, we realized actually this is true. A healthy mind, how important it is. Believe me, leave the corona, but the fastest growing ailment throughout the world is depression. The fastest growing ailment. And the psychologists say, every second man, I don't know uh, <coughs> to what extent this is correct, but they say that every second man, one way or the other, has some psychological problems. They are not 100% okay. Somehow, somewhere, you know, uh, they have uh, the mind problems. Negativity of the thoughts, they say, it creeps in, spoils the body. And the perception of the people working in the organizations, how important does it become? And that is why, you know, how well I would be able to work depends on how healthier I am both physically and mentally. कि एक आदमी कोई डॉक्टर के पास जाता है, है ना ऑर्डर दी से कि डॉक्टर साहब मेरी वाइफ को ऊंचा सुनता है, उन्हें सुनने की प्रॉब्लम है, तो प्लीज कोई मेडिसिन उनके लिए दे दीजिए। और ये डॉक्टर से इस के लिए कितना ऊंचा सुनता है? इधर कि अब ये तो नहीं पता पर ऊंचा सुनता है उसे, नहीं क्या नहीं? घर जाओ पहले पता करो कितना ऊंचा सुनता है और उसके बाद टेक द मेडिसिन घर जाता है तो कहते हैं 20 कदम दूर से वाइफ खाना बना रही है लंच तैयार कर रही है किचन के अंदर तो 20 कदम दूर से आवाज मारकर पूछता है पता करने के लिए कितना ऊंचा सुनता है कि ये आज खाने में क्या बनाया है सो ही डजंट रिप्लाई वो 10 कदम आगे जाता है दोबारा से पूछता है आज खाने में क्या बनाया है कुछ नहीं सुनाई दिया पांच कदम और आगे जाता है आज खाने में क्या बनाया है कुछ नहीं सुनाई दिया बिल्कुल पास खड़े होकर फिर पूछता है जी आज खाने में क्या बनाया है तो जवाब मिलता है चौथी बार ही बता रही हूं कि आलू की सब्जी बनाएंगे मतलब यू नो वेयर लाइज द प्रॉब्लम एंड आई हैव ऑलवेज इन माय माइंड दैट द अदर पर्सन हैज ऑलवेज प्रॉब्लम and the doctors say, believe me, this is truth, the doctors say, this is spoiling you, this is spoiling your body, and this is spoiling everything including your relations. And that is why when they say healthy mind and healthy body or swastha bharat, sampan bharat, because you will be able to work only when you are healthier. And that is why when the government says, Fit India movement, thousand of uh, crores rupees only for Khelo India in the budget. And when they say 
that okay 3300 crores of the rupees would be spent on uh, health and uh, welfare and the total budget for uh, this if you compare with the uh, five years back they have increased to the tune of 13 plus percent and they say the government of india says let the people of india be healthier let they go outside and play especially for the students those who are sitting here let everyone move out and play because to be healthy sports or uh, playing the games uh, is important not only to sit always on the computers and work and that is why i said uh, i know the purpose for which uh, this seminar has been organized would be fulfilled because swast bharat means this swast college means swast chandigarh and means as i said uh, swast india and only then when we are all healthier will be able to work <coughs> when we work will be able to <coughs> earn and when we earn will be able to get that sampannata with it says thank you very much for uh, calling me here and a big big congratulations to the college and the organizers for organizing this very apt uh, seminar my best wishes thank you very much god bless you